full room, thank you very much. It's nice to see you all. Welcome to PyCon. Thanks for inviting me. <sighs> I've been waiting for a long time to do this. Live long and prosper, peace and long life. 43 years have I waited for that. There it was. I was a young man. I saw a show that inspired me. This fellow is Spock. They have a terrible problem. They have a smart computer. Kirk was assessing the danger of the problem. What was the nature of it? And Spock said something that inspired me for the rest of my life. What was the M5 computer? The multitronic computer made by Dr. Daystrom. It is the human mind amplified by the instantaneous relays possible in a computer. And it sent chills down my spine. It wasn't a great episode. <laughs> but that sentence was important. And it, uh, to me, it wasn't about the Dr. Daystrom computer. The more interesting part is the human mind being amplified by the instantaneous relays of the computer. Can we use our machines to make ourselves smarter? We've waited a long time to have that happen. Algorithms have been around for a long time. Depth first search, breadth first search, Monte Carlo uh, tree search, graph traversal algorithms. Uh, over 30 years ago, I was reading books on neural networks. None of these things are new. What has changed? They've been put together in interesting ways. The algorithms have become smarter. Our computation power has become massive. And these machines have gotten smart. And so we have a new way that we can program that we didn't uh, have available to us before. And so the theme of the talk is, instead of writing programs, we write descriptions of the problem and then let uh, solvers go solve them. And I think we live in a wonderful time. It's a great time to be alive, and I'd like to show you uh, some of these tools. The, uh, typically, the best way to show them is not with real-world applications, is to show games or puzzles or toy problems. But uh, to the extent that these tools can solve those problems, they can also solve our real-world problems. So I'd like you to use your imagination a little bit. If I show you the solution to a puzzle, we have to mentally translate that to something far more interesting, which is uh, optimizing our, uh, our programs, finding uh, uh, bugs in multi-threaded code, et cetera. So without further ado, I will uh, uh, take you through. Let's do a quick intro. Where are we headed? Problems defined or well uh, uh, solved? Uh, I found something on the net that said things better than I could say them, so I'll just put it up on the screen. Roughly, it's easier to make rules than to find a way to follow them. So sometimes, if you just have a description of a problem, it automatically gives a solution if we put it into a solution finder. So uh, the tour I'm going to give you is I have a lot of stuff to cover. I'm going to show you depth first and breadth first search. That doesn't sound interesting, but it is, in fact, powerful. The next step up in capabilities is called SAT solvers. In a way, it's kind of boring. It's following truth tables. But once uh, the truth tables become really large, they become very, very powerful. So I'd like to show you what they're capable of and how to access them from the Python world. Reinforcement learning is a very simple concept. We do it to ourselves all of the time. We've taught machines how to do it. I'll show uh, the simple uh, algorithm uh, for that. Then I'll take you into a space probably a lot of you've never been into. How many of you have heard of TLA plus? Oh, this is fantastic. It is actually becoming more popular as we speak. A year ago, possibly no one in this room would have heard of it. How many of you have used Z3? My work is done here. <laughs> all right. You guys are ahead of the game. And then the next step up in complexity is can we combine all of those tools together and uh, uh, Monte Carlo tree search, convolutional neural networks, and reinforcement learnings to defeat human beings? Okay, so we'll talk about uh, Alpha Zero, uh, which is an amazing, amazing accomplishment. So what to keep in mind as we explore is, one, how little code is needed to express these ideas. Number two is how generic the tooling is. Uh, what is great about all of these problems is that the best solutions to these tools weren't custom, or to these problems weren't custom designed for the problem. 
the custom design uh, solutions in the end got outclassed by the generic solutions. So keep that in mind as we go along. The generic tool is more powerful than the specific tool. And then uh, also keep in mind, I'll show you fun toy problems, but these problems will be at the periphery of human capability, the outer limits of our ability to think, which is great because if we can take a computer that far by amping up the computational power, we can take it beyond our own abilities, achieving the goal that Spock had uh, uh, laid out for us. That said, that episode was a cautionary tale. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit at the end to see where this all ends up. Do we all die or do we uh, all uh, reap the benefits of uh, AI as we go along? We'll explore that at the end. All right, first thing, depth first search, breadth first search. Do those uh, diagrams speak for themselves? Depth first, which way does it go first, down or sideways? Down, which is why it's called? Oh, I see, okay, breadth first, which way does it go? Okay, so different types of problems uh, warrant one solution or the other. Often, if you're trying to find the shortest path to a solution, you do a uh, breadth first search. However, you'll find the Monte Carlo tree search, the uh, tools that were used in Alpha Zero, for example, uh, do a depth first search. They play out an entire game of uh, uh, a chess several times and then go back and decide, based on how the game turned out, what move uh, uh, to make. So what tool do you need in Python uh, in order to implement a depth first search or breadth first search does anybody know? I, it's going to be kind of a story. I don't want to give any hints here at all. Okay. All right. So uh, Collections Deck is a tool uh, that works really great for this. Uh, you decide whether new tasks should be prepended to the queue uh, for depth first or appended uh, to the queue for breadth first search. It's actually very easy code. By the way, everything I'm going to show you, I'm giving you code for. Uh, when these slides go up, you can run all of the examples, including the chess program. Sound good? All right. All right. So once upon a time, many years ago, I wrote a generic puzzle solver. It solves a broad class of uh, so, uh, puzzles. Here's the core idea. The puzzle solver doesn't know anything about the puzzle. All it knows is how to solve puzzles. So the puzzle solver, the way it's used is we subclass the, pub, uh, the solver and we add in some extra information. What is the initial position of the puzzle? What is a rule to generate all the possible moves from the next position? What moves can I make? And are we at the goal? Keep in mind the solver knows nothing about the nature of the game. It just says, where do you start? What can you do? Where are you trying to get to? I'll take you there. That's fantastic. Uh, you can throw in some extras. Uh, a nice wrapper will make the output of the uh, puzzle recognizable to us. And some uh, uh, problems have complementoric explosion, and that can be managed sometimes through exploiting symmetry. So there is a way to exploit some positions that are uh, considered equivalent. For example, in tic-tac-toe, if you start a game in the upper left corner, it's isomorphic to a game uh, where you start in the lower right-hand corner. So we can teach the computer to recognize that those positions uh, are the same and that speeds up the solution. Neither of these two things are required to get a solution. They either just make it faster or they make it look prettier. So here's a, uh, a classic uh, simple problem. Given these two, uh, two empty jugs with three and five liter capacities and a full liter uh, jug with eight liters, find a sequence of pours so that you get four liters and the two largest jugs. The purpose of this example is to show how to use the solver. We import the puzzle subclass the puzzle, and describe the problem. And so we give it an initial position, zero liters, zero liters, and eight zero liters. We put in some constraints. What's the capacity of each jug? And what's the goal? Four liters, four liters, and zero. The interesting part is the iterator here. It's not the clearest code I've ever written, but it gets the job done, and it's short, sweet, and easy to test. So given a position, if you run the iterator, it generates for you what is the next possible positions, what pours are possible. So from this initial position, you can pour the eight ounce jug into the five, leaving three, or you can pour the eight ounce uh, into the three, leaving five. And so this generator generates those two possible positions. The interesting thing I think about this puzzle problem is this solver didn't know anything about this puzzle. When we tell it to run solve, 
it uh, outputs the uh, example. So here's how to uh, uh, run it. We make an instance of jug fill. We ask, what is the initial position? Is it the goal? And to, uh, to uh, loop over, what are the possible moves? But if you run the solve method, it starts, picks one of those moves, and it finds the shortest path solution to that problem. Now, this is an easy problem. This is the kind of problem you give to a fifth grader and let them toy out and learn a little bit of math. But if you start to throw 10, 20, 30 jugs in there, it becomes an enormously complex problem, isomorphic to the uh, uh, knapsack problem, a very hard problem, a problem that quickly exceeds the limits of human capability and actually, at some point, exceeds the limits of our computational power uh, as well. In other words, while this uh, was a cute problem, when you scale it up to a harder problem, it becomes really interesting, such as uh, optimizing a, a, a program. Everybody get the basic idea of how the uh, generic puzzle solver works? Describe the puzzle, it gives you the answer which is the theme, describe the uh, problem, and the solver solves it for you. So there's another interesting puzzle uh, going back into my history here that also dates to about the time I saw that Star Trek episode. There was a puzzle that looked like this with different colored pieces at my uh, grandfather's house. I called him Paw, so I have labeled this code the Paw Puzzle. What was interesting to me about this puzzle is not so much what the puzzle was itself. The puzzle was to slide the blocks around and take this big block. By the way, can you see my arrow? Yes. Okay. Take the big block and cause it to be in the lower left position, which sounds pretty easy. The fascinating thing to me about this puzzle is my grandfather was a fairly smart man, knew lots of other smart people who liked to come over uh, to his house, and they'd find the puzzle and all attempt to work it. I have never met another human being ever in my entire life who was able to solve this puzzle. The only person I've met in my entire life who was ever able to solve the puzzle was me. Would you like to know how I did it? I wrote a computer program. One of my first computer programs uh, was written in BASIC that solved this puzzle in much the same way that I am solving it uh, uh, now. Only when I saw the solution did I realize why it was hard. The uh, combinations spread out quite a bit, but they loop back to each other, and it makes this very tight graph with one little exit door. And if you don't know that you're at the exit door, you pass it up. If you go through that exit door, it opens up to another graph that has lots of positions that can cause you to go back to the original state, but it has an exit door. And if you don't find it, you stay inside that little loop. And then there's another exit door on the other side. There's an enormous number of moves in the uh, uh, solution. Uh, well, at least for a puzzle that looks this simple, it's surprising the solution is about uh, 80 moves. So essentially, all I needed to do was to come up with a representation for the uh, uh, position. In this case, I've got a nice wrapper that will print this out in a block form so we could recognize the uh, uh, piece numbers of the puzzle. And then for the goal, I used a regular expression and said, if the one block ends up in this position, we've solved the puzzle. In other words, it needs to know, where do I start? Have I achieved my goal? And the more interesting part is the uh, iterator. Again, not the most beautiful code I've ever written, but this is about 15-year-old uh, uh, code for me. <coughs> There's a couple updates that are inside, but mostly it is that it was, it was originally uh, uh, written. And this tiny bit of code that describes the problem solves it. Let's, uh, let's see if I actually got this up here. It was. You are running Python 3.8, are you not? It's out. Alpha, but you can run it now. And its output was it gave me from the initial position every possible move until you uh, got to the end. It's not a particularly pretty output. That said, without the wrapper, each one of these would have been on one line. And so that was about 88 uh, uh, moves. And it makes very short work of a problem that, as far as I know, no smart human I've ever met has been able to solve this problem. You guys get the theme of where we're going? Describe the problem. Solver solves it. Depth first search and breadth first search are amazingly powerful. Can, uh, did the world get more interesting after uh, uh, tools like that came out? Yes, SAT solvers. So is it okay if I get technical at a technical conference? Can I get all technical on you? If I show you a little math uh, that reminds you of your worst days in uh, college, are you going to get up and leave? Okay, here we go, a SAT solver. 
SAT uh, is spelled in all caps. It's for satisfiability uh, uh, problems. And the idea is it solves problems that are specified using propositional logic formulas. Most people start running at this point. So the idea of a propositional logic formula is you take a problem statement. If our tire is flat when I remove it, and take, uh, then I will have to remove it and take it to the gas station. Our first step is to translate that into uh, logic statements. So take each phrase and assign a letter to it, P, Q, and R for rem uh, each of the uh, uh, predicates in the solution. Write it in symbolic form. This is not hard to do. Most of you have forgotten how to do it, but if you'd like to uh, use these tools, you need to recover that knowledge. Uh, use these slides as something that takes you through step by step and will let you reacquire the necessary knowledge. So here's the truth table uh, for that. Uh, given these statements, is this one true? So in the truth table, our, our states are essentially these first three columns. Our output state is the uh, our last column. What SAT does is ask the question, on the right column, are any of the outputs a T? Are they true? And uh, not all SAT solvers, but most of them, can give you an example of a row where a T is uh, uh, true. That doesn't sound particularly interesting because we could just loop over these and find a T and print it out. Does that sound powerful? It does not sound powerful. And this problem is not very interesting. Where it becomes interesting is these tables, the size of this is with three variables. We got two to the third power, eight rows. So if you have 10, uh, ten variables, you're at two to the uh, uh, tenth, looking at about a million rows. 20 variables, uh, you start to go up again by uh, square that again. And 30, you're up into uh, billions. So what if you had a thousand variables? Would the problem become complex? There are more states than there are atoms in the universe. Does that sound computationally tractable? It is an intractable problem. It is provable that it's intractable. But most real world problems have symmetries and patterns inside. And so we live in a great time. During the course of my lifetime, every year, somebody has attacked this problem and said, are there little patterns inside that we can exploit in real world problems? And every year, SAT solvers have gotten smarter. Not a little smarter, a lot smarter. It is not uncommon now for people to run uh, SAT problems with over a million variables and have it find a solution. This is astonishing. It uh, reminds me of Asimov saying, any sufficiently advanced uh, technology is indistinguishable from magic. It is magic that we can find answers to these problems. So why do we care? There's many otherwise really difficult problems that we can uh, solve. Our amazing fact now is that this problem is now tractable for thousands or even millions of variables. So what do you need in order to do this in Python? There's a tool called PicoSat and an interface to it in Python called uh, PicoSat. It's not the only solver. There's a number of them out there. And um, in order to use these tools, you have to sound like a mathematician. You have to say things like conjunctive normal form with straight face. Try it all now. Without cracking a smile, say conjunctive normal form. Okay, which is means uh, a product of sums, an uh, and of r's. So here's an and, here's some r's. And so that was that original problem statement, the previous expression rewritten in conjunctive normal form. In uh, the SAT solvers, it's common to write the negative uh, uh, case, negative p, as a minus one, and the uh, positive case as a, uh, a positive one. And then the second variable, this would be a positive two, and this would be a, a, a negative one. So in PicoSat, we describe this problem with this list, minus one, two, and minus one, three. Doesn't look very humanistic, and the output is this, which is the five true states. Fair enough? Okay, so all it did was you describe the problem and it looped through uh, the output. That doesn't seem impressive. So our, our core challenge uh, in working with this tool is to take things like this that are not humanistic and make them more humanistic. It doesn't ship with such a tool, so I wrote one and I'm giving it to you. Uh, it's not a lot of code, but essentially takes uh, phrases that we can understand and translates them into uh, this. 
In particular, if uh, my translate function says, let's rewrite that input as not P and Q and not P uh, and R. And it translates it into these numbers for you. Does that sound like an improvement? Interestingly, it's kind of difficult sometimes to get things into conjunctive normal form. We actually start normally with something like this, disjunctive normal form. And turning one into another is an absolute pain. Wouldn't it be nice to have a computer do that for you? So I wrote a, pro, uh, a function called from uh, DNF that converts this one into this one, and then the translate turns it back into this number. In other words, it takes something you can understand and turns it into something the machine can understand. And so uh, to make this all picosat readable, here's a problem input we can understand and an output we can understand. Uh, that said, it's better to not use variable names like PQ and R. How about flat tire, need to remove, and go to gas station? And here's all of the uh, true conditions. Is that a little bit better? Okay. So I'm giving you these tools. I hope you use them. You can run all of this code. So I uh, wrote some higher level convenience functions. Some of says, uh, at least one of these is true. One of them, the of, says exactly one of these is true. And a quantifier says the quantity of trues, in this case, is less than or equal to one. And it turns out that's a really nice input form because lots of problems fall into that uh, uh, format. So I think uh, at every point, people get curious about uh, uh, machine learning and solvers. At some point, you write a Sudoku solver. It's not a difficult thing. Actually, I'd like to poll here. How many of you have written a Sudoku solver? OK, lots of you. And I wrote one a long time ago. This is not about that. I reject my earlier Sudoku solver. No matter how much effort I put into it, I cannot make it as good as this one. We have a generic solver that's been polished every year, year after year. There's conferences where people devote themselves to making small improvements to the underlying solver. And if I want to have a good solution to, let's say, a very complex su Sudoku, 100 by 100, which is something that most of your solvers would fail on, all I need to do is describe the problem, hand it to a really badass solver, and let it make short work of the problem. So the interesting part is not us writing a Sudoku solver. Our interesting problem is, we describe it, and the solver solves it for us. So this particular puzzle, we can enter it in row major order like this. That's just my representation. And our expectation is that the computer will solve it, and this is the answer that it actually uh, gives. I think I have five such puzzles in here. Right then, three, eight, Sudoku, bam. It takes five puzzles, and here's the input puzzle, and then Here's the uh, solution for it. And I'm giving you all of the source code for that, but I didn't do any logic on this. I did none of the things that the rest of us did when we made uh, Sudoku solvers. Instead, I merely described the problem. What does the uh, grid look like? How do we fill it out? Establish facts about a given point. And most of this is just converting this input and showing how to output. This is uh, uh, the wrapper for it. So the logic part of it is basically this amount of code. For each point, we said every point is assigned one value. You can put one number in a box. Also, one number only goes in one box. This is a byte injection, a one-to-one -one relationship. That describes the puzzle generically. We have an, uh, that's the unconstrained puzzle. The constraint that we have is for a specific puzzle, we have some clues. What is it that we already know about this puzzle? Uh, which numbers go where? So we establish the basic fact. So it takes basically five lines of code to completely describe what a Sudoku is. It takes another two lines to describe a specific Sudoku and then tell it to solve it is solve it. How do you like that? Was that a little easier than the Sudoku solver that you wrote? Okay. Keep in mind, unlike the one you wrote, and the one that, unlike the one I wrote, this one scales to enormously hard problems. So uh, what's up next is the Einstein puzzle. Uh, who made it? Who made this puzzle? Aha, none of you fell for it. Reportedly, Albert Einstein made this puzzle, but it is not true. And reportedly, he said less than 2% of the population can solve this uh, puzzle. This is lore, neither fact is true. That said, it is a rather famous uh, puzzle. 
and let's look at the description of it. There's five houses in unique colors. Each person has a unique nationality. Focus in on the word unique. That means we're going to use the one of function that we mentioned before. And there's going to be a bijection here, like we did before. Each one of these values is uniquely assigned to a house. And so this describes the unconstrained problem. Now we get the constraints. Uh, the Brit lives in the red house. The Swede lives, uh, keeps dogs as pets. The greenhouse owner drinks coffee, etc. And the goal is who keeps the fish? So there's a really nice write-up if you're interested in the problem on how to solve this problem manually, something I'm profoundly uninterested in at this point. What I'm interested in is getting this answer to pop out automatically, and this is more than just the answer to this question. It says exactly every, where every value is assigned to every house. So the interesting thing, I think, is how we describe the puzzle. We say, what are the house numbers? What are the various groups? You'll recognize that these lines correspond exactly to these lines in the problem description. All we're doing is translating a problem description into code. And the constraints, things like the Brit lives in a red house, that comes next. And we said, same house, Brit and red. In consecutive house, the white house is after the green house. And a specific fact, the milk is found at house three. Now say, solve it. There's really nothing more to it than that. Is that my first 10 or second 10? Is that my first 10 or second 10? OK. Engage warp drive. All right. So I had to write a couple of helper functions uh, in order to do this. That just took my one of and from DNF that I mentioned before, and then gave them nice humanistic names. You should always do this. It isn't hard, but it makes your life a lot easier than trying to talk to the tool uh, directly. It means your problem descriptions are completely humanistic, and you can explain the output. So uh, the utilities you need for that, this is the code that I wrote for you so that you could write uh, generic solvers. And uh, if you use this, PicoSat becomes something you can use in the first few minutes. Otherwise, you'll spend two days coding your problem into it, and it would have been cheaper to solve it by hand. Fair enough? All right. Uh, we are done with SAT solvers, but before I leave, I should just say, these are really badass. I showed you toy problems. These scale up to enormous problems. Imagine this problem with a million variables. And so where do these problems come up? So it's used in um, uh, Anaconda. What's the their their, the installer, Conda. So in Conda, Conda has to make decisions about what packages conflict with one another uh, and what their dependencies are. This is a complex problem when you have lots of packages. What tool do you think they uh, use to solve it that starts with a sa and ends with a ta, has three letters? They use PicoSat. They use exactly this technique for a fairly complex real-world problem. OK, pattern recognition and reinforcement learning. I can do this one uh, uh, fast. Problem statement, I need to get my son to eat broccoli. He's seven. It turns out he actually does eat broccoli, so this is no longer a problem. I'm amazed by that. I didn't eat broccoli until I was much older. Strategies discussed between Rachel and I. One, acclimatization. We can serve it once a week until he gets used to it. A better alternative. You know, broccoli is better than spinach. Or I can entice him. You know what? We'll watch your favorite movie after you eat the broccoli. Any of your parents have tried all of these strategies? Trickery. Oh, eat the broccoli. It's candy. <laughs> Testimonial. Oh, your best friend, Luna. She likes broccoli. You like Luna. Therefore, by the transitive law of likes, you like broccoli. <laughs> Wait it out. Young man, we're not leaving this table until you've eaten your broccoli. Piecemeal. Just try one little bite. No, not that little. I didn't know you could eat a bite that song and appeal to reason. You know, it's a great source of vitamins K and C. These are all strategies, which raises the question, which one strategy should we use? How about we randomly try a strategy, and if it works, we choose that strategy more often. And if it stops working, we choose it less often. Easy enough? Aha. You're taking a picture of my screen. That means I did a great job making my slides. But did you know? I will give you these slides. All of them. And not in picture form. Like you can get uh, these slides will be in HTML so that you can run the code directly. That's it. I'll stand in front of it so you can take a picture later. Yeah, go pose. All right. So 
Uh, I've given you a rock, paper, scissors game here instead of uh, eating broccoli. Uh, we pick a strategy randomly, see if it works. And the interesting thing about this is I first saw this program in Creative Computing Magazine over 30 years ago. And I was amazed by it because rock, paper, scissors is an unwinnable game. It should just net out to zero. But what if you can anticipate what your opponent is going to do? You can do better than uh, average, uh, which means you have to pattern match and figure out what has your opponent been doing. So this game is more interesting when we do repeat play. So uh, I had some Python skills that I've listed in order to understand the code. We don't have time to go over them now, but this will teach you some Python that you might not have known, how to transpose uh, 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 keys and values, how to group pairs, how to use the new random choices um, uh, function, et cetera. But essentially, we define the game, rock, paper, scissors. So uh, paper beats rock is a, uh, a one. And we come up with the ideal response, what is the winning response, and our options, what do we have to choose from? Our strategies are we can choose randomly, we can choose one thing proportionally, uh, let's say rock two-thirds of the time, uh, we can do digraphs. Whenever a person plays scissors, scissors, you know they're going to do rock next. Uh, so these are a series of strategies. It doesn't really matter what they are. You just need a set of them. The interesting thing is I make a list of them, and the algorithm is roughly choose our move. How do we choose a move? We take our strategies and choose one strategy randomly according to the weights. And the initial weighting is Everything is equal weighted. All strategies are equally good. Then we find out what the opponent's move does. So I chose telling my son that it was candy. Then the opponent decides not to eat his broccoli. So what we need to do is update our move history and strategy weights and say, I'm not going to try the candy trick as much anymore, but I never fully take it off of uh, uh, the list. This is the entire algorithm for uh, reinforcement learning. Does it sound impressive? No, anything that you can write in a few lines of code doesn't sound impressive, which is not to say that it isn't badass. This thing can learn and beat you at rock, paper, scissors over and over again. I defy you to do better than uh, uh, average on this. You will find it's not a fun game to play. It gets really boring because the computer is really quick, but you can do a, a hundred rounds in about five minutes, and at the end of that, you will find that as random as you try and be, this uh, I have never seen a person defeat this thing ever. It will learn your random patterns and figure you out. Oh, wait, Google Law and Facebook already do that to you. Okay. <laughs> All right. <coughs> All right. <coughs> a lot of what we do now is trying to figure out what other people are, uh, are going to do. So uh, this is called a multi-arm branded approach. Uh, it scales to other games like this, and it scales to more interesting games. Everybody got uh, how that one works? So the next level after this is SMT uh, Solver. So uh, if you want to sound super technical, you need to know some lingo. What is, if you know what SMT stands for, you're going to be very popular at Silicon Valley parties. You know, it stands for Satisfiability Modulo Theories. You're like, whoa, can I buy you a drink? All right, see how that goes. All right, so I say this is the next step of up because this, uh, we've gone up from a tree searcher and sat solvers. Our state is now more complex than just a truth table. And we're searching a graph instead of a tree and we're introducing temporal logic. How many of you know about temporal logic? It should be exactly the people who knew TLA uh, plus. I don't know why I had uh, fewer hands go. TLA plus is all about temporal logic. Temporal logic means I'm not evaluating my goal state as, did I get to a goal now? It's the succession of states. Do we get a series in a row? So, uh, did I get a chicken, and then later did I get an egg? Did the two come uh, one after another? So we have uh, uh, goals that say something is always true, something is eventually true, something is always eventually true, and that says there's, it's a reasoning about a succession of uh, states. So a good example of this is the dining philosophers problem. How many of you are familiar with dining philosophers? This is great because my picture for it is not showing up on the uh, screen, but it involves a bunch of five philosophers and five chopsticks. You actually need 10 chopsticks, they only have five. 
Each, uh, in order to eat food, you need to have two uh, chopsticks. So the interesting thing is how to model it. It's very interesting, easy to do the unconstrained model. Every chopstick is either unused in the hand of the philosopher to the left or in the hand of the philosopher to the right. So you can get an entire state by describing it with just five letters. All five chopsticks are unused. This one is held by the left philosopher. This one is held by the right. The number of possible states is three to the fifth power. Does that sound like a big state space? It does not sound big, but we're not interested in the states. We're interested in all possible uh, paths through the um, uh, state tree. Now, if you know this state, you have an implied state for the philosopher. Is the philosopher thinking, eating, or trying to eat? And so here's our transitions. If a chopstick is unused, it can be picked up by the left philosopher or by the right philosopher. If it's currently in use, it can become unused. So there are only four transitions out of uh, each state. So this is like the Sudoku model before we have the clues. Now the clues are our strategies. The interesting thing about the dining philosopher problem is most people's first attempt to solution, solve it always sounds correct, but is actually wrong. It's very educational, and it's the reason that we use it in education, is it teaches people how hard it is to make correct multi-threaded uh, uh, code. So here is an obvious strategy, which is when you're hungry, pick up the left chopstick. When, you, uh, when the right one becomes available, pick it up. After you eat, put them back down. I call this strategy D because it results in deadlock. This fails. Strategy S is a really terrible strategy, and it says, the first philosopher picks up the left chopstick and never lets it go. This causes the, chops, uh, the person to his left to starve. The S stands for starve. That person never eats, which is not a desirable outcome. Here is the happy strategy. You can make a request for a chopstick. This is not the best strategy, but it is one that works, which is when I want to eat, I put in a request to eat, and we keep a cue of who uh, gets to eat next. And if you are the next, if you are not next in line, you wait. And then uh, when your request becomes available, you acquire the left, acquire the right, and when you're done eating, release both. This strategy works. The interesting thing is it is not obvious which of these strategies works and which one fails. What we would like is a tool to where we input our strategy and it tells us whether it succeeds all the time and if it fails, gives us a failing test case. Does that sound useful? Have you ever written multi-threaded code? Complex multi-threaded code. How many of you have written complex multi-threaded code that's correct? <laughs> How many of you wrote complex multi-threaded code that was correct and then somebody bypassed a lock and made it incorrect after the fact? So how many of you have ever written a complex, multi-threaded piece of code that you believe to cor be correct and has a test suite that can prove that it is always correct? Oh, then you have a use for this sort of thing. Because the kind of tool that can verify this for you can also generate all the test cases that shows all allowable state transitions and you can have your program inform you if it's ever uh, uh, going to not match the model. So. The interesting thing about uh, these solvers is they have uh, transition graphs. They say they use temporal operators. A temporal operator says things like predicate P is eventually true. Or in our problem is a person with a, lock, uh, a left chopstick eventually gets a right one. Uh, another one is that something uh, is always eventually true. That is kind of different from the other one. It says after you eat that someday you might get to eat again. <laughs> Okay, and more than uh, 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 once. So here's an example. The solvers we saw before would look at one of these states and say, is this a goal state? We no longer care about this. We never actually stop. This thing doesn't terminate. The dining philosophers are always eating and thinking. What's more interesting is this person eats, then eventually they get to eat again. So the temporal logic gets to express if you have this state at this point, you get this other state at another. You get the time part of the uh, invariant temporal. This thing was true at one point, it will become a true again. All of these things have happened before. All of these things will happen again. No Battlestar Galactica fans, okay. All right, uh, if you want to feel really mathy, you should express it in TLA plus. It's incredibly mathy. This is a TLA plus description of uh, uh, the problem. 
I've given you a link to a nice write-up on it to get started with it, and a link to uh, how to get started with Microsoft Z3 that also makes short work of this problem. And what's great is the uh, Z3 Pi package lets you get there from uh, Python. We learned something new. Who's ever going to write a complex multi-threaded piece of code ever again where you haven't model checked it and generated test cases uh, to make sure that it always stays correct? Oh, so you learned something new and useful. This is good. All right. Next one up is a little bit harder problem. Learn to play the most complex uh, uh, games known to humans, but the input is only the rules to the game. So how about I teach my son to play chess by showing him just the moves for the uh, game and teach him nothing else? Is that a cruel way to teach a person uh, chess? But I can use reinforcement learning. I can just beat him game after game after game. But my son is smart. He will observe what I'm doing and learn from his defeats and eventually beat his father. I know this is true because this is how I learned to play chess. My father showed me the moves in second grade and beat me game after game after game after game. And I never gave up. And then in eighth grade, he encountered something he'd never encountered before, defeat. <laughs> and it was repeatable. <laughs> I got good at it. <laughs> I got better than my dad. Did it take a long time between second grade and eighth grade? How would we like to compress six years into uh, six hours? That's AlphaGo, or uh, AlphaZero. AlphaZero was kind of cool. What we proved is gen uh, how generic it was by, we gave it the rules for chess, then we gave it the rules for Shogi, which is a computationally more complex game than uh, uh, chess, and we've got the lance piece that can move like a knight, but an extra one forward, but also s pieces that can switch sides after they're killed and can land anywhere on the board. And then Go, uh, which uh, all three of these games, the input to them was simply the rules of the game. And in each case, after uh, six to eight hours of training, Alpha, uh, Alpha Zero learned to beat the best humans in the world, but also the best computer programs in the world. The best computer programs in the world for chess were custom designed for chess. This one wasn't custom. All it knew was the rules. And it means that there's a broad class of problems that we can solve now simply by describing the problem. Keep in mind there was enormous computation power. Six hours is impressive until you know how much computation power they uh, threw at it. They threw a lot at it. So this is a, a, a thing of beauty. This is a typical result. Uh, this is uh, after a few hours, Alpha Zero destroying the best uh, program in the world, which was uh, uh, Stockfish. Uh, it is nice to play this one out. If you're interested in chess, just move the pieces and you will see a thing of beauty. Uh, possibly the best game of uh, chess ever played. It's a wonderful thing. Which raises a question, what do we think about this? Here's two assessments. Uh, in the AlphaGo paper, which I've given you a link to, there's you, one behind a paywall at Science uh, Magazine, but uh, they've also got a preprint that's available for free. And he said, our results demonstrate that a general purpose reinforcement learning program can learn tabula rasa, that means no inputs at all, no domain specific knowledge or human knowledge, can succeed in multiple domains, many games, achieving super performance, uh, performance in multiple challenging games in a few hours. This is pretty badass. Gary uh, Kasparov had a uh, what seems like a self-serving uh, uh, comment on the whole thing. He says, I love it, style of chess. It plays just like me. And that seems self-serving, except Gary Kasparov was pretty badass. And this thing learned to play like a human. Uh, it could set traps uh, uh, for people. All right. So I've got a stop sign, but uh, my stop sign says I've got five minutes to stop, which is great. I'm actually on time. This is amazing. So code you can run. Is uh, Alpha Zebra open source? No. But Leela Chess is. And the install is using uh, Python 3's Mesa, uh, Mason. I would say this whole, whole thing is uh, Python 3, but Python is not fast enough. C is not fast enough. Can we do better? What it does is generate uh, CUDA code that runs on your GPU. And this is great. And so you can uh, go to this link, 
download it and start playing chess against the best uh, chess program in the world using exactly these techniques. So this is Monte Carlo uh, tree search. It essentially says, let's select a pattern. Let's run it out to the end of the game, determining a win-loss, run multiple simulations, and then back propagate the results, weighting them along the way, saying this move ended up being a good move, this ended up being a bad move. This is almost exactly our reinforcement learning algorithm that I mentioned on the previous page, but with a tree. And if you want the full algorithm, this is basically it. And let's talk about the future. Where does all of this go? I'll make, hey, this is a risky page because what did Master Yoda tell us? Difficult to predict the future is always in motion. That said, we have to ask ourselves, does this end badly? How many of you think it's going to end badly? There is reason to think that is true. That, however, there is a very deep thinker who has thought deeply about this problem, a person who has done battle with me, these machines, a person who has defeated machines initially, then defeated by one machine, and then routinely defeated by him. One of the smartest people in the entire world has thought carefully about this problem, and I love his book. Gary Kasparov doesn't think this is going to end badly. I highly recommend his book called Deep Thinking. It reads like a work of fiction. It's a real page turner. It'll tell you a lot about AI. And keep in mind, he was one of the uh, brightest of human beings who early on did battle with a computer and eventually lost uh, 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 to the machine. And he's uh, uh, got some very deep thoughts on how we're going to interact with these machines in the future. What, which of our jobs it's going to replace, how it will help us, how it will harm us, how it will uh, uh, adapt. I think it is a fascinating, wonderful, and great time uh, to be alive. Thank you so much for coming to this talk. Please get these slides. Please run all of uh, this code. This stuff is ready to use today, and it's not that hard. Live long and prosper.